Can I swear? Please do. Yes. <laughs> James, you're getting an since the interview is so early in the morning. You, yes. You're getting you're getting an exclusive Elvis heritage. I decided I looked at it. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna keep it for James. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually you you um I've been reading up on you, Murray. You 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 actually you did uh Elvis sort of way back when you first started doing drag, didn't you? You know what, James? That was I was that the first thing. I mean, that's you know you know how far I go, uh, I think that was ninety two or ninety four. There's a picture. I actually have it up on my wall. Yeah, that was the one of the first things I did was a fat Elvis, like the sweaty pill popping, um, and I did it at this place called Cake on Avenue B at fourth or fifth or something. Now that was Avenue B then. So it yes. was sketchy, but you know, you know, I don't want to get all into, into the theory academic stuff, but unless you want to, but you know, I did the, the fat sweaty Elvis popping the pills because the drag Queens that, you know, I grew up, well, when I got to New York, at least and Boston, you know, that I saw, they always, they were so exaggerated and campy and like taking the, the, parts of femininity and like crazy women and like blowing it up so I was like oh I'm gonna do that because Elvis was a you know a parody of himself at the end yeah but at the same time I, of course I loved him too yes so anyway yeah so I was like we, we put um sweat so that I looked like I was sweating I had pills like and I had I was so broke back then that I borrowed like 150 bucks from Martha Wilson who, um, you know, founded Franklin Furnace, the performance art. I used to work there as an intern, James. You're getting all the exclusives. So she lent me money to buy that damn Elvis suit. <laughs> and I, I got in there and, I, and that was like my first, um, I, did, I did the Elvis performance at Cake while I was in grad school. It was nuts. Anyway, yes. so I'm yes, that's it. We're... We're bringing it back. Not the Austin yes. Young Elvis, the Chubby Murray Elvis. <laughs> and of course, we'll, we'll get on to um, somebody somewhere in just a moment. But whilst, whilst no, we're talking- Whatever you want, James. I, what? did, first of all, when did I just last see you? I know we don't I, have much time. It, it Recently. Was, I, I think when we had a screening of um, the, the finale of-, of No, some, Christmas show. Did I see it at the Christmas oh, show? Christmas show, of course, yes. Because, okay. um, yes, the, which, which got me in the mood. Fabulous. I loved your Christmas show. Yes. Okay. Anyway, I'll shut up now. And my so friend this, Boy Radio was in it too. So yeah. Your friend. We'll get. We'll talk about that offline. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, getting all you know, blushing us. So yeah, just just sticking with with drag for a moment. When, when was the first time that you actually saw drag kings? Um. And what kind of impact did it have on you? Well, so. I had seen so many drag queens when I was in Boston and in New York. <clears throat> and then I saw a, a flyer, like a paper flyer for um, a club called Hershey Bar. And that was in the meatpacking district before it was what it is today. So it was like real dark, you know, industrial, empty. So there was a... a it was called, a, it was a drag, it was like a very like tough kind of passing, like urban dyke, hardcore dyke night. And there was a drag king contest. So I went in as a photographer and I took photographs of these guys. And, you know, it wasn't, it, it, it was, it, you know, this was a long time ago, James. So it was the drag, you know, it was, it was more almost about passing and being masculine and kind of strutting like people, you know, kids, I have pictures of it and stuff. You know, these, these very butch masculine women would get up on stage and have the suits and, and like strut and then the women would go nuts. You know, and back then, you know, there weren't, there weren't words like trans mask, trans man, tra you know, there was none of that. It was like butch femme, that was it. So these were very like butch, like, you know, so I, I was at some of those early nights and, you know, I noticed that there, there wasn't in that particular venue or event, there wasn't 
that camp silliness, you know, um, element, that positive energy. It was more like dark and masculine. So, you know, that was when things started forming that I wanted to bring some of the elements that I had seen in the drag queen and then a lot of the feminist stuff I was reading into the drag king space, you know, so that it, it was like very pivotal, those, those, you know, early years of the stuff forming in there. So I brought comedy, you know, and, and camp and all that kind of stuff into, you know, my act and stuff like that. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm, I mean, I could talk, I, Talk to you about all the, um, this all day, so maybe we, maybe we can go back oh, to yeah. it. But let, let's talk about um, somebody somewhere because I've just had the pleasure of watching all seven episodes, and I, I haven't actually realized how much I've missed this show until the first sort of few minutes of um, of season two. And I was like, oh, it's so good to be back, and it's like kind of being reacquainted with an old friend and one that you don't really have to like dress up for or do anything for. You know, it's that kind of vibe, and uh, I just especially at the moment as well I just like love the gentleness and the warmth and the inviting quality of it so how about for you so that's me as a viewer but how about for you as someone um, part of creating this and being a cast member um, on the show well you know you know we know each other so me Jeff Bridget and Mary Catherine you know we've known each other for a long time um and you know we're all very much individuals and kind of, you know, it, it not, misfits in our own way. Like every, I think we're all, you know, Jeff has his thing, Bridget has his, her thing. You know, we all have our own thing. And then, you know, that's made us kind of outsiders our whole lives. Um, so to come together and create this, this world where, you know, we're all equal. And, and it's just like, okay, here's this world. You know, we're all going through all these things like normal people, like everybody else. And, and I think that's the common denominator of it, of the, it's the humanity of the show and the heart of the show that people I think really respond to. But then, you, then you put this kind of world on uh, HBO, you know, which for us kids in New York, you know, that have been slugging in the business as outsiders for 20 plus years to kind of get validated by HBO and then and then it's put into the mainstream and then this is what I always like it so now it's this world in the mainstream that's available and it's not threatening it's not in your face and like you know it's like hey this is how other people live and it's the same things we got the same heart we got the same romantic problems we got we're lonely you know we are silly it's it, it's just I don't know. It's just, it's like a slice of life for the misfits that somehow shows our humanity. It, I don't know. I'm talking too much, but you know what I mean? It's, that's what I like yeah. about it. Yeah. And it's also, as you, as you were touching on it, it's like, it, it's, it's created that world, but then um, it can then deal with pretty serious things like we all have to deal with in, in life. Yeah. As you say, like the, the the positive things like love, and then also the very hard things like the, the grief. And uh, but it's in this special place. That's well, it, it's you know, it's relatable. Yeah. And the thing that I that blows me away is that you know I've had a couple of girlfriends in my life, James, and you know some of them are from the old days. And you know my ex girlfriend's mother, who's in her late seventies is obsessed with the show because it's real. She sees it as real people, real stuff. And then, you know, so the, and then you have, then you have the gay guy. So it's like all these different kinds of people, but it's like, you know, it's when, you know, like a, a 70, 77 year old woman in the suburbs is like feeling it. You know, that, that, that show, but it, to me, that's what show is. You can relate. Yes. So it's not a show where, it's you know it's kind of like fuck you this is me yeah it's more like this is who we are yeah and uh, it kind of given that like, I mean in, in the first season um it wasn't like explicitly mentioned that Fred is trans and then in this season it gets very casually mentioned and and that's kind of it but does it feel kind of important to sort of just mention it and particularly 
with this, the show's reach and with all that sort of, you know, go, going on at the moment in terms of the misinformation and the, the legislation and that, that kind of environment? Yeah, well, in the, in the first episode, and uh, with your background there, in your Zoom thing, you know, there in the poker scene, there's a trans and gay pride flag in the back. All right. So if anybody saw that, they they might have seen that. Yes. And, you know, I think that we wanted to mention it, you know, kind of briefly, because it's more about everyone is the same, is because of what's going on, you yeah. know, uh, currently that has been going on. And then, you know, since we filmed the show and like now, which is like the last month, you know, it's really it's it's really important to you know representation matters yeah and i think fred is handled in a way that you know it, it he is just like everybody i can't give any spoilers out but you know so we did mention you know how he identifies just a little just yeah. as as a you know as respect to what's going on in the current climate yes yeah mm -hmm. um and the, well, we first got to meet Fred doing his kind of MC duties in, in season one. And of course, we, we did see him off stage and got to know him a little bit off stage. But I feel like this time, there's less of uh, Fred's sort of showbiz <laughs> side. And what do you enjoy about kind of going a little bit, maybe a bit deeper with the character this time and get, you know, showing us a lot more of him? And there's, thankfully, there's, there's a lot more scenes uh, of you this time. And, you you know, you really- Yeah, right to the network. Yes, exactly. So thank you for giving us more, more Fred. <laughs> but also, yeah, like, like, as I say, sort of less showbiz Fred in, in some ways. Um, we, we've always seen his humanity, but I, I feel like we do. Would, would you agree a little bit more this season? You got to sort of go a little deeper with, with Fred. Yeah, and, and James, you know, between us, even though it's an interview, you know, sometimes when, or most of the time, I should say, drag queens, drag kings well there's not a lot of drag kings on tv trans people gay people you know they're often um portrayed as tokens in shows stereotypes and very limited scopes so you know yeah fred had a little of the showbiz razzle dazzle the first season and i think this season what excites me is this character got to have some more depth like everybody else and I and I think you know, and and if there had to be a little less showbiz for that, that's okay with me. So you know, we got we got to see Fred more as a you know a person with with a heart, and not just a heart with his friends with Sam and Joel and all that. A heart with his heart, and you know, I can't I don't want to give any things away, but you you know what I mean. So um, I'm happy that that the writers chose to show more, you know. A kind of a full emotional picture like starting to a, a Fred this season yes because we also need that on screen yes exactly yeah it's and, tough and there, out there James yes <laughs> um th there was a lovely uh tribute to Mike Haggerty I think uh through the character that he played um Ed Sam's uh Sam's dad because obviously he, he passed away after the, the first season um what did you make of the way that the writers kind of handled that as I say it does feel like it's really honoring Mike through Ed and you, you have a uh, Fred has a great speech at one, one point touching very touching yeah you know I it, it's tough because we had you know the, the writers and Bridget they everybody had to like make these last minute kind of adjustments before we started filming and you know I think the hardest thing is you know talk about heart right he such a special guy but he brought so much heart to the show so you know I think we all felt that and wanted to honor him and his spirit and his heart you know in the second season and you know there wasn't a lot of time to figure out how to deal with it, it could, and it's also like we're all dealing with it you know because we had already pretty much already started production you know when it was going on so yeah, he was there in spirit for sure. Yes. And it's yes. like, you know, I, I said this, I don't know, I might have said this to Bridget the other day, but, you know, my own um, relationship to my biological father, who's also passed away, you know, was incredibly strained. And, you know, when I did that scene, 
with um with Mike in season one, like we had this, you know, you know, it's I guess that's the magic of show business too and human connection. Like I didn't even think that I was acting or doing or like we're both in a field with the cameras. It was like what he was telling me and what I was telling him back, it was like I believed it. Like I cared for him that much. And we we had it was like some kind of you know therapeutic transference or something. I was like, he's more he was more fatherly figure that you know I had personally and to everybody on the damn show so anyway I miss him and the whole thing sucks yeah but but, but it was um, beautifully handled on the on on this season of the show yeah and um Murray have you been um writing your memoir have you, are you is that something that you're doing doing at the moment yes yeah what well, what's that sort of process has been like of kind of reflecting back and then trying to, I guess, sort of articulate it in some kind of narrative. I know, I, I keep thinking of like the title should be, you know, how to clear a room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know, the thing that's interesting is, you know, because kind of going back to what we started at the beginning is, you know, I kind of came from the old school, like Bunny, you know, Lady Bunny where we were these characters and you never knew anything behind them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, you didn't know your real name, you didn't you know your birth name, you didn't know where you lived, you, you know, all this shit. So, you know, as time has progressed and as things have been more open and there's more language, you know, I think my story of how I grew up and then how I became Murray and then navigating all this stuff and then kind of getting to this point plus all the, uh, you know, the biopic struggles in between, uh, you know, I think it's a story that needs to be out there. Yes. For the same yeah. reason, somebody somewhere, it's like you, you, you know, you live this very kind of specific life on, on the outer skirts and then, you know, you put it out there and then people can relate to the humanity of it. And then yeah. it, and to me, my act, my whole vibe is my, has always been about that is I'm going to come in. I'm going to, I'm going to tell some jokes. I'm going to relate to you. And then we're all going to be fine. Yeah. You know, you're not going to see me be like, ah, blah, blah, blah. he's like, oh, there's Uncle Murray. He's funny. That nice guy. I like him. Yes. Yeah. And so, but so l last question for you. Um, it's for your favorite piece of LGBTQ plus culture. So it could be um, a movie, TV series, a book, artwork, you know, photography, musical, theater, and anything you can think of culturally, or a person who identifies as LGBTQ+. So someone or something that's had an impact on you and kind of resonates well, with the, you. I mean, I mean, I mean, we could do a whole interview on that. Yes. I think uh, my first we, we did was... we we did uh, Bridget last time because Bridget was with us. So we mentioned Bridget and she, she said, if there's a season two, you'll be in it. So maybe <laughs> I think you're no, you're already in it. So. <laughs> Um, so that's the only thing you uh, the only person you can't mention. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's so much. I mean, Bette Midler, Hello Dolly, I saw it three times. Does that make me gay or something? <laughs> I mean, full blown. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm like, you know, I love like Liza, like all of the, the kind of gay male icons for some reason. I love them all. You know, Liza, Bette. I saw Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn May at Carnegie Hall the other night. You know. So the, the divas, they're your, they're your divas. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like I like a strong woman who makes it. Yeah. And then that's where, you know, that's why I said Bridget last year. Yes. Well, um, Murray Hill, thanks so much 